Today on the Bandrew Says Podcast, we'll be talking about a bunch of new gear that was just announced at NAM 2019 Winter Edition. So go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 200, a.k.a. 200, my doggy boy! woo Ruff, ruff! What? How did I last 200 episodes? What does that even mean? <laughs> there are timestamps in the show notes and description of everything that I talk about, so you can skip around to whatever you want. If you do want a different different version of the show, audio or video, you can find that at bandrewsays.com. I just want to... <laughs> I just want to start barking. I don't know why. And if you want other educational shows, you can find that at geeksrising.com. The only news we're going to be covering today are the new gear announcements from NAM, or if you're like me from a few years ago, NAM, a bend and NAM, man, look out for Charlie up in the tree. We're going to be covering that. So if you're interested in microphones, interfaces, or a new DAW, whoo, what does that mean? Go ahead and let's get into it. We'll start with the Samson Q9U because I am so excited about this. Everybody knows I'm a proponent. I am a cult leader for the Samson Q2U. Q2U hype. Q2U cult. This is a new member of that family. Hopefully. Hopefully it will be good. I really do hope it will be good. It's a $200 USB slash XLR dynamic microphone from Samson, and it looks like a blend between the Shure SM7B, the Audio-Technica BP40, and the Rode PodMic. On the back of it, it has a high pass, meaning a low cut, and it also has a high shelf filter on the back, which is the exact same filtering options that you'll find on the Shure SM7B which makes me think they're going for that kind of aesthetic and hopefully that type of sound because I am a lover of the SM7B's tone. The thing that makes me think this will not sound like the SM7B is the fact that it has a neodymium magnet. That is the same type of magnet used in the RE320 and the RE27ND, and I have tried quite a few different dynamic microphones with a neodymium magnet, I have found all of them to be significantly brighter. So unless Samson has built in some kind of circuitry and filtering to naturally roll off the higher end, which I believe is what the Shure SM7B does, I am anticipating that this will be a much brighter microphone. Hopefully, it will be good though. I really, really want this to be good because for $200, to get XLR and USB-C, 24-bit, 96K, that would be an amazing upgrade from the Q2U. And we wouldn't just be the Q2U cult whenever somebody says, hey, what should we get? Should we have a microphone for a budget? Ah, Q2U. We could break that cycle a little bit. <laughs> that is the announcement from Samson. Comes out in April, I believe. 200 bucks, and I cannot wait to get my hands on that. Next, we have another podcasting microphone. This is the Sontronics Podcast Pro. And I can't find any official Sontronics photos of this, and I don't want to steal from some other audio news outlets. I don't want to take their photographs, so I am not going to have a picture of this. But it's a dynamic podcast microphone. It comes in either black and red. And there was a journalist who said, Why? (laughs) Why are you making two different colors? The guy responded with streamers, streamers, camera, YouTube, because people care what their microphones look like. I think that's kind of a dumb thing to care about, but people do. So they are making microphones that they think are attractive. Also, it uses the same capsule as their Solo, Halo, and Corona Corona microphones, which are all dynamic microphones. I have not used any of them. I have not used any Sontronics gear because there is only one dealer or distributor in the US and they're not widely sold. But this version has a lot more plosive rejection or 
I guess, wind protection built into it. So hopefully that will make it more capable of handling the rigors of podcasting because (laughs) we all speak directly into the microphone and expect a microphone to not have any plosives. Hopefully they are doing that. And the last thing I want to mention about this microphone, it is hand built in England and it's only going to cost $100. That doesn't add up for me. If it's made in England for $100, I am guessing it is made in England by imported slave labor. (laughs) That's the only way it makes sense to me. I'm just kidding, of course. I am just kidding. Sontronics, that's a joke. I don't think you actually have slave labor or child labor. That's a joke. Anyways, (laughs) the next microphone, this might be one that has me more excited than the Samson Q9U, but it is not going to be something that podcasters are interested in at all. This is the Lewitt Project 1040. This is a project that Lewitt just announced it announced at NAM, where people can sign up to be beta testers of this new flagship tube multi-pattern condenser microphone. And if you want to sign up for that or apply for that, you can go to lewittaudio.com or lewitt-audio.com. On the front page, they have apply to be a beta tester. Of course, I did that. I want to get my hands on this thing and play around with it. And we don't know much about the specs or tone so far, but it looks very, very fascinating because this has a full control console that comes along with it that will be fine-tuned to fit exactly what the users or the purchasers of this microphone need. And it has quite a few controls over the tonality of the microphone. There's the ability to switch or blend between tube and FET. I believe this is a feature that is also on their 940 microphone. You can blend between the tube and the FET. There is also nine polar patterns on this thing. Five full polar patterns. There's omni, bi-directional, cardioid, hypercardioid, and something else. And then there's all the in-between positions as well. There are 40, 80, and 160 hertz high pass filters, a negative 6, negative 12, negative 18 dB pad options. And then there's this tube coloration dial. It allows you to select clear, warm, saturated, and dark. That is what I am most excited about. I have the, what is it? The Warm Audio WA-47, which is a tube condenser. I know Steve Freeman absolutely loves that thing. When I plugged it in, I let it warm up for 30 minutes or so. This thing was so dang bright. It is so bright. I like the idea of having the ability to adjust the tone of the microphone right at the circuitry of the mic because I am assuming that's where the actual processing or filtering is occurring. They are adjusting how the tube and the FET and all maybe the voltage they're sending to the tube is affecting that. I think that is a super fascinating idea, and I really hope I'm selected to beta test it. If not, I will maybe buy it because they're 940. It's $1,700 right now. So if this is their new flagship... I'm guessing we're we're going to be looking at a $2000 price tag when it's finalized and that's a lot of that's a lot of money. That's that's a lot of damage. That that's all the microphones that I was excited to see. There was a pre-Sonus launching of a I think they had a dynamic but also some large diaphragm condensers. Mackie launched some microphones as well. I am not that interested in those. I will probably end up reviewing them, but I think those three announcements are what are most exciting in the microphone side. Now, let's talk about interfaces. There is a never-ending stream of interfaces being announced. There were more than what I am going to talk about, but the first one is the one that I am most excited about. This is the SSL 2 and 2 Plus. If you don't know what SSL is, that stands for Solid State Logic, and they have been a staple in large recording studios for decades. They make very high-end 
outboard gear and consoles and pretty much everything you would need to record a high quality professional level recording. Well, they are finally getting into the budget conscious home studio runner. They launched the SSL2 and SSL2 Plus, which are both sub $300 interfaces, which is unheard of for SSL. I think the lowest priced item that they have currently or prior to this was their mixer. And I was, when I saw that announcement, I think it was last year, I was hoping 600 bucks. Come on, five to 600 bucks. It's $1,500. It's a fully fledged SSL channel strip. Really high quality stuff. But this is going to have an EIN, the SSL2 and SSL2 Plus, an EIN of negative 130.5 dB. That's bonkers. I think the lowest I have seen is negative 129.5 or maybe negative 130. Negative 130.5, that is insanity. It has a gain range of 62 decibels. <laughs> That's a that's a lot of juice. That's pretty powerful. If it's capable of actually providing 62 dB of gain, that is absolute insanity. It has 24-bit 92 kilohertz USB-C. And the thing that is most interesting about this is it has a 4K mode. And this is not some shady marketing thing like we've seen some other companies do. Hint, hint, AKG. There's no such thing as a 4K microphone. <laughs> what are you talking about? 4K compatible. This has a 4K switch, but it's not saying this is a 4K microphone. That button emulates their 4000 console. The things that it is doing to the sound is it is adding a high frequency boost, but it's also adding, as they put it, subtle harmonic distortion. Now that's all well and good, but what really matters is how it sounds. I will put this thing through its test on guitar. I will try it on vocals, on different microphones, see if it adds some really nice clarity to the SM7B, the RE20. But Brandon from, not Front Page Tech, This Is Tech Today. <laughs> Front Page Tech is Jern. From This Is Tech Today, actually just got his SSL2 Plus. I am so jealous. Vintage King, I hate you. Vintage King, I ordered my SSL2 Plus from Vintage King. They canceled my order, said, we can't confirm who you are. Where? So I had to order it from somebody else, Sweetwater, and they're not getting them until like February. Curse you, Vintage King. I could have my SSL right now. But he has his already. He recorded a quick sample using the MKH416. I believe that's his microphone. He tried it with the... 4k enabled and without the 4k and i think it adds some nice additional tonal qualities to it it does bring out the sibilance a bit on the 416 which is already in my opinion a little bit of a sibilant microphone but to my ears it sounds like a really nice interface and i cannot wait to get my hands on it then we have audient releasing a new interface which seems to be a more entry level or beginner friendly interface this is the Audient Evo. I have not seen any pricing for this. I heard somebody say around $130. If that's the case, awesome. I highly doubt it's going to be that low, but if it is, that, that will be a very good price. It comes in two pre or four pre modes, so you can have two or four XLR microphones. There's a 58 dB gain range, an EIN of negative 127, a dynamic range of 113 dB, and this seems pretty comparable to the Audient ID4. If I am not mistaken, that's the same gain range, the same EIN. Not 100% sure on the dynamic range, but it seems pretty comparable. The main thing that seems to be a standout feature or a, a selling point for the Evo is this new Smart Gain feature. What this does is you hit a button or hold a button, and that tells the interface, okay, we are going to measure the sound source you are recording. You jump on the microphone and you play the loudest part of your guitar or you sing the loudest part of the song or you scream into the microphone like you do while you podcast. It uses that quick sample and determines, okay, here is what we need to set the gain, gain at 
to ensure that you don't hit zero dB. I'm not sure if there is a setting to adjust how much headroom it leaves you, but I think that is a really good option for beginners who don't want to learn how to set their gain. There are plenty of them, and you can just go onto Twitch and hear it. Lots of clipping all over the place. This might stop that. Please, for the love of God, stop that. <laughs> so I think this is a pretty cool option, and if that is a useful and successful feature, I will highly recommend that to beginners who don't want to learn anything about audio, i.e., how do you set your gain properly? What is clipping? I don't mind. I think loud, distorted noises are funny. Okay, well, if that's what you think, go buy the Audient Evo. <laughs> the next thing is going to bankrupt people. It is the Apogee Symphony. Symphony. Sim. Symphony. Not sin phony. Symphony. There is not too much information available about this thing, but it's a $1,300 to $1,400 purchase, depending on if you want some additional plugins. This is the cheapest version of Apogee's Symphony, Symphony line. Why is that so hard to say? It's the cheapest version of that, and their Symphony line is incredibly revered. It is top tier. You find it in the, the most amazing studios. Their A to D converters, their D to A converters are thought of to be as some of the best. I know, again, I'm bringing up Steve Freeman. He loves the Apogee. A to D converters and D to A converters. I think he's finally switched over to U Audio though, or switched back to U Audio because U Audio is doing some killer stuff right now. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But this has onboard DSP, something that the the Apogee Duet did not have, and they have two separate preamps that you can use for the DSP, or you can use the DSP for. It is the Neve 1066 emulation, and then some United States tube saturation. I'm guessing it's some kind of universal audio. I am not 100% sure, but it is a tube preamp. So you can get the sterile, super transparent Apogee A to D converter sound, A to D, or preamp sound, no coloration. This is the microphone. Take it. You can get the Neve coloration the the solid state coloration or you can go tube and just warm warm warming up warm up the entire sound so they give you a bunch of options that has 70 75 db of gain and that's the apogee symphony i think if you are already an apogee user you, you are going to be very excited about this if you're not you're going to say 1300 dollars. no way and the last interface that I want to talk about is the PreSonus IO Station 24C. This is essentially a an updated version of PreSonus's mixer port. I believe that's what it was called, or fader port. It was a single channel strip kind of thing, but all it did was allow you to control your software. I am not sure if it was only for Studio One or if it worked for other DAWs as well. But this adds XLR and instrument inputs, so it is a fully-fledged audio interface with the fader and the control for all of the processing you do on your channels, all sorts of stuff along those lines. Seems really, really cool if you want to have the physical controls to play around with and you don't like doing everything 100% in the box. Yes, you are still doing everything in the box, but you have some physical controls to play with and you aren't stuck manipulating it with a mouse. This does 24 bit 192 kilohertz, 80 dB gain range. I'm guessing that is because there's probably 50 to 60 dB on the actual preamp. And then there is 20 dB that you can boost it using the fader. That would be my guess. The EIN is negative 128 and the dynamic range is 107 dBA and it's priced at $300. There you go. That is it for the interfaces. There is one other thing that I want to talk about. This is something that I was, I was waiting with bated breath. I had guessed what it was going to be. I wasn't sure that they were going to do it, 
but I was right. Universal Audio is releasing a DAW titled Luna, and it's going to be coming out this spring. And the thing that I am most excited about, it is free if you own an Apollo device. I don't think it's if you own the Arrow. I don't think they're giving the DAW to you for free if you own the Arrow. I don't know if you can buy it at all. If you don't own U Audio stuff, maybe. That would be interesting. But if you own an Apollo device, one of their twins or their rack mount devices, you will be getting this DAW for free. And it's only Thunderbolt and up. If you have the USB version, you're not going to get it. I think there are some add-on features that will cost you money, one of them being Neve Summing. So that allows you to create a bus. And in that bus, you can add some Neve saturation and distortion, whatever the hell you want to do with that. I've never used a Neve summing device. Would it be a summing pre? No, it would be a summing compressor, like a bus compressor. I'm not sure. I am not sure, but it has that. I think that is an additional add-on. And they do have some instruments in there, like a piano and a Moog, a Moog synth. But unfortunately, if you get this DAW, you cannot use those plugins or those instruments with other software. You are stuck using those in UA Luna. I am going to give this a shot when it comes out. I have been in Logic Pro for over a decade, I think, at this point. Yes, over a decade. It's going to be a difficult switch if I do actually switch, but it'll be interesting to see what it does and how it works out, how it affects the tone of the sound. That is it for the NAM coverage from me. I just wanted to share the announcements that I was most excited about. I would love to hear from you. What were you most excited about that was announced at NAM? Is there a new microphone, a new interface, a new instrument, a new piece of software? What are you going to actually pick up from NAM? I know I am going to be going for the Sontronics, I am absolutely, I am waiting with bated breath for the Q9U, and I would love to try out the Lewitt Project 1040 and the SSL2 Plus and the Audit Evo. Not really so much the PreSonus or the Apogee, but I think those are things that people have been waiting for. Let me know in the comments or send me an email or a voicemail. What did you think of NAM this year? Are you excited about anything? And let's jump to what you had to say. First comment comes from Spencer Rogers. He says, You mentioned equipment having an on-off switch being novel, and I had the same thoughts before I found this channel. I started up a podcast about two years, and I did a big equipment upgrade about a year ago, and basically everything I got, board, headphone preamp, etc., doesn't have switches, so if I want to power them down, I have to unplug them. This never made sense to me. Spencer I agree 100 million thousand times percent times infinity. Exactly. All electronic devices need to have an on-off switch. It, it's so intuitive. Why would you not have one? How much room are you saving in the chassis by omitting that feature? One issue that I have with the UA Aero is that when it's plugged in, it will power cycle throughout the evening if you don't unplug it. So you have to ensure that you unplug that device to make sure it's not power cycling all night and you hear the DSP clicking on and off from the other room. That's something I found out about six months after I did the review. But I don't understand anybody who does not include on-off switches. That's why I am really enjoying the WA73 EQ and the X8 from Universal Audio, I come in, hit power, hit power, I'm good to go. I don't have to go behind the device, plug it in, pl unplug it when I'm done. Like the DBX-286S, how does that not have a power switch? That is the dumbest design choice. DBX, add a power switch. Name it the DB-286SXY... Sexy? What? <laughs> Add a power switch, please. I agree, Spencer. That's the moral of the story. Next comment comes from Riali Music. He says, 
I am hearing a weird white noise interference coming from your mic, almost like a crackling noise. I would check your chain. Riali Music, thank you very much for the comment. I listened back to last week's episode. I don't hear what you're talking about. When I am done recording and when I publish my show, I listen back on my studio monitors. I listen back on the 7506s. I listen back on the HD 650s on another computer. I listen back on my IEMs, my Sure 425s when I am at work. I listen on my car stereo, and I did not hear that on any of those playback devices. I am not sure if there is something, so I want to pass the question off to anybody else who is listening to this show. Do you hear some kind of white noise interference with this current chain? Or is it potentially, or do you think it's potentially something in Reali Music's playback system? Because I did not encounter that on any of my playback devices. And I even cranked the volume up to near 100%, which was not fun for my ears. But I didn't even hear it when I did that. So I am guessing, Reali, that it is it has something to do with your playback device. Thank you very much for the comment. I appreciate you. Next comment comes from IDWACIJC. That is, I don't want a channel. I am just commenting. He says, Would you do more expose episodes if you had a great Dane named Scooby, three homeless friends, and a van? ID Dub, thank you very much for the comment. I appreciate And that is a very interesting question. It is always a possibility that I would have more exposed videos. If I didn't have a job, I lived in a van down by the river, and I had 24 hours a day to go and investigate these creepy old people wearing masks and all of that stuff. One issue I see with this, though, is I don't do drugs. I don't really enjoy or rely on people who do drugs. I am sure that somebody out there is going to take offense to that and say, I do drugs and I'm super reliable. Sure you are. No offense. No offense. Go do your drugs. Do whatever you want. I'm not going to not going to rely on you for anything. <laughs> so I am not going to rely on a stoner dog. I am not going to do drugs so that I can talk to a dog. I am not going to have Scooby snacks and I'm not going to have a bunch of a bunch of people who don't have dang jobs. I'm not going to rely on them. Now I'm getting all, I sound, I am such a boomer. I am such a, I should go bring Boomer Drew in here. I'm not going to do that though. I sound like a boomer. I would love to be able to do more investigations like that, but (laughs) no, I don't want to live in a van. I don't want a bunch of stoner friends who are bums and don't have jobs. I don't want a talking dog. No, I'll pass on all of those things. Now that I've offended all the youths, whatever let's go to the next question the next comment it comes from rosh he says could you compare the vivo boom arm with the road boom arm rosh i am not sure about doing a full video on that but i did order the vivo boom arm about two weeks ago and i got it it works it works fine it feels much flimsier than the boom arm that it is ripping off the oc white OC White has one, and I believe that Yellow Tech has one just like that as well. Those are all $300 plus boom arms. The Vivo, the boom arm is made out of plastic, and it feels very flimsy in comparison to the $300 boom arms it's ripping off, as well as even the $100 boom arms that don't really look like it, but achieve the same thing. The Rode PSA 1, not sure about the Blue Compass. I've heard some bad things about that. I didn't have any bad experiences with it, but I've heard some bad things. The Heil PL2T, if I could spend 60 to 100 bucks, I would go with the Heil or the Rode over the Vivo. But the Vivo does look cool, I guess. And you're getting it for 60 bucks as opposed to 360 bucks. So I understand why people would want to pick that up. I appreciate you sending in that question, and that's my take on it. Now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. (music) 
Alrighty, if you want to go ahead and send in an email, a voice, or a video submission asking a question, or just sharing your opinion on anything, you can go to askbandrew.com and check that out. And I try to make it as easy as possible on you, because I want to hear from you, because then I don't have to read. First email comes from Heather, and it says, Hi, Bandrew, how are you? I'm okay, I've had a lot going on lately, but I saw your retweet of Alina Smith's tweet about not tearing down other creators, and unfortunately, at the same time, saw an example of a podcaster tearing down a podcast listener who shares their listening experiences on social media. This was awful to see. As a podcaster, I am grateful for the opportunity to hear from anyone who listens. I know that it's not a given. I also respect people's time and opinions, but above all, I uphold that I don't have to agree with everything and everyone or watch and listen to all of the content, but being a content creator or not, it does not give me the right to tear someone else down for their thoughts or opinions. If someone is sharing their reviews or thoughts and experiences with podcasts on social media, they are probably doing so because they enjoy listening to podcasts and are passionate about sharing that with others to offer useful insights or to just thank and interact with the hosts. That's valuable engagement. Here's my PSA for the new year. If you are creating content and you want people to engage with your content, be decent. Show some respect. You are not above anyone else, and you are not entitled to belittle them. Heather. Heather. Thank you very much for that email. Very, very insightful. And what a great goal or a PSA to start off 2020. I appreciate so damn much. If you don't know about Heather, Heather is the host of the Sunshine and Power Cuts podcast. You can check that out at geeksrising.com or sunshineandpowercuts.com. Last week, a music producer by the name of Alina Smith tweeted out, why are so many creatives so vicious to each other? Someone else's success is not your failure. And I retweeted that and I added, this times 1000%. Someone else succeeding does not affect your ability to be successful as well. Support those around you and celebrate them doing great. And this is something that I am pretty adamant about. I think every creator needs to be reminded of this, that seeing somebody else succeed is not a negative reflection on you. It is not you failing. They are not stealing your audience. There are billions of people on planet Earth. That means there are billions of potential viewers for your content. Your content creation journey is not the same as person X, Y, or Z. You just need to find the niche that you can work in and grow and work towards that. I know that I will never be as big as MKBHD. But I don't look at MKBHD and say, oh man, he got another million subscribers. I have failed. He's stealing my audio. No, that's ridiculous. I don't look at at Booth Junkie and say, oh my God, serious? Why? I don't look at Produced Like a Pro or In the Mix and say, oh man, I don't have as many subs as them. I am a failure. As a creator, it is a difficult thing to be. It's a difficult thing to not compare yourself to others, but it's really important. And Heather, that makes me very sad that somebody is tearing down other people just because they are sharing their opinions about shows that they enjoy listening to. And I can tell you this, if I were to know who this person tearing that person sharing, that that's very confusing. If I were to know who this negative person was insulting somebody on the internet, I simply wouldn't ever want to deal with them because they seem like a real, real Grinch. I will say that. As you said, if you want to, I guess, be a content creator, it's not a good practice to be a complete ass on the internet, to degrade other people, to tear people down. All that does is make people think that you suck. That you are a bad, unfunny, unlikable person and that they don't want to work with you. So if you want to be a creator that does that, more power to you. Good luck. And to be clear, I am not saying that disagreeing and making debates or I guess counter argument videos or podcasts 
is a bad thing. I am not saying that that falls into this into the same category. But if you just say, if you see somebody tweeting, I like this, and then somebody responds with, you're an effing idiot for liking that. That person is an asshole and people are not going to like that asshole. So Heather, thank you very much for sharing that. That is an amazing PSA to start out 2020. I appreciate you. Let's jump to the next email, which comes from Stefan, and they say, Hello, Bandrew. What about single versus multi-pattern microphones? Is a single pattern microphone not better as it's specialized and a multi-pattern microphone has to cope with different patterns, multiple capsules, and a more complex electronic design? What's your take on this? Kind regards, Stefan. Stefan, thank you very much for the email and the question. What a fun and interesting topic. I will start by saying, when you get into the upper end of microphones, I don't think that this will hold true. What I'm about to say really is focused towards budget microphones. But when you get to $3,000 microphones or even above $1,000 microphones, I think that the budget that the company has for each device is at a point where they can get very high quality components, very high quality capsules, and they aren't trying to cut corners to keep the price as low as possible. They are trying to make the best device that they can, and they have the budget to get good quality components across the board. When you get to the super high quality stuff, the $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, you're getting good quality across all fronts. But when we look at the budget or entry level devices, I 100% think that a single polar pattern or single use microphone is going to serve the person who owns that microphone a lot better, or at least it will provide a better sound quality in most cases. Or maybe I should say it will most likely use higher quality components. Let me explain why I think this. Let's say a microphone company has $100 to build a microphone. They are building a cardioid condenser microphone. They have the PCB, a single capsule that is only cardioid, and the body. That means, let's say they could spend $33 on each of them. $33 on the body, $33 on the electronics and PCB, and $33 on that one capsule. Cool. Now let's say there's another company who has $100 to build a microphone and they decide to go with a multi-pattern microphone. They have 33 bucks for the body. They have maybe 40 bucks for the PCB, which means they only now have, what would it be, $27? Would that be right? 27 bucks for the capsules. And they are not just using a single capsule. They have to get two or three capsules. So now they are spending $9 per capsule as opposed to the $33 that was spent on the single cardioid microphones capsule. That is why I think that at the budget range, it really is, you're going to be get, getting higher quality components in, in most cases in a single use, single polar pattern, no frills microphone as opposed to a multi-pattern mic at the same price. I hope that made sense. I think in my head it made sense. Let me know if, if if you're confused about anything, but I appreciate that question. It's a really fun topic for me, and I would love to eventually do some kind of comparison or something. All right. Last, we have a voice submission from Orange Juice. Orangey Boy from last week is back. Hello, Bandrew. It's me again, Orangey Boy. And I have another question. So on Audacity... How do you insert a voice recording into the middle or the beginning of something? Because when I'm done recording a podcast, it always makes me, when I hit record, if I want to add like some voice submission, of, like a part a disclaimer or something, it always makes me record at the end. How do I like insert an audio that I record at the beginning and not the end or in just in the middle or something like that? Thank you for helping. You're a bloody legend. Thank you very much for the voice submission. I appreciate you doing that and eliminating my need to read because good golly gee willikers, I suck at it. And it's always nice hearing y'all. 
I have no idea to answer your question because I don't use Audacity. I have never once used Audacity. I went ahead, headed over to YouTube and did a quick search and I found a video that explains exactly what you are looking to do. I will link that in the show notes and I hope that helps solve your problem of splitting your audio, moving the latter half of that audio and recording something to put in the place there. I hope that helps. Best of luck to you, Orangey Boy. Appreciate you sending in two voice submissions in two weeks. That's amazing. And that is actually going to wrap up for this episode of the show. I do have one personal thing to talk about. That is, it's episode 200. It's episode 200. I cannot believe that we got to this number. It's bonkers that anybody listened and followed and watched from the beginning and that y'all are still here. It, it warms the cockles of my heart to bring back that phrase. I appre each and every one of you. That sounds weird. I do appreciate everybody who watches and listens. It does mean the world to me. You're amazing. How we got to 200, I don't know. <laughs> but instead of spending an hour or 30 minutes patting myself on the back, doing some kind of self-celebratory episode, I wanted to focus on making an episode that would remind people, hopefully, hopefully it would remind people why they, they subscribe to the show, share some news, share my opinions on it, and be as helpful and informative as I can. I hope I accomplish that, and that's what I was setting out to do. Maybe for episode 208, 208, 2008, 208, I will do something special. It won't be very long, but the reason we would use episode 208 is because at that point, we will have 200 episodes that are currently live and available. The first eight episodes of, of this show, they're lost to the ether. They will never be heard by anybody. They are atrocious, terrible they're gone forever, and I don't want the MIB banging at my door trying to get them taken down again. So <laughs> that's where we are. Again, thank you so much for sticking around for 200 episodes. I appreciate you. You are amazing. I wouldn't be here without you. I will talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Bye. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.